Hey everyone, this is Brian here from Massey's Main Entertainment. We're back again this week uh, after, you know, we're going to continue our series here that we started uh, just last week where we're giving our top five movies for each particular year. Starting in 1965, our goal is to get up to 1979. Uh, so I'm joined today by my buddy Doc. Hello. Doc, uh, who, who I had to remind to actually dress himself. And Rich, Rich, who is waiting out a storm. And Randy here, who's trying to convince me that I need to put Elvis in a top yeah. 50 albums of all time, which is just never going to happen. So, uh, so this week we're going to be covering 1966, uh, which, we, you know, some of us are discussing it before we actually turned it on. We thought, oh, well, this one's a little bit better than 1965. I kind of felt it was the same, but I'll let you guys kind of fill in the blanks here a little bit too. Doc, what did you think? What did you think it was a little bit tougher, easier? Uh, I would say, uh, uh, top end stuff, you know, it's, uh, uh, 66 probably as a, at the top end, probably a little better for me, but I think overall for 65, I felt stronger throughout my top five than I say, uh, I will here in 66 for me. Yeah. Randy. Well, I don't know. I, this, this year, I think I was, there was more movies that I was considering to make my top five than, than in 1965, but you know, it's all relative, yeah. I guess. Yeah. All right. What about you, Rich? Are you saving are you saving anything for the the finale? I, I kind of agree. They're, they're very equal as far as top end, middle end. Uh, there were a lot of contenders, but up in I think the first what six years of the '60s were about the same. 19, 1967 is a banner year for me. That's when things really start to take off. The rating system comes in. You got some high end movies. It'll be tough next time we uh, meet to uh, pick five movies, in my opinion. Right. Well, how it works, everybody, is uh, we're going to do a round the horn style. So uh, that means we'll go five, 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 four, 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 and so on. And uh, we ro we're rotating the we're rotating who goes first and last and, uh, as we go. So today I have to go first. Doc, you get to go second. Randy will go third. And Rich, he's in his cleanup spot, which he always likes. He just – he. he but prefer to go in last every time. I know he does. So be sure to <laughs> like, like and comment and uh, subscribe if you would down below. I did pick up quite a few subscribers on the last video and we did really well with comments and likes. Considering it was our first video in quite a long time together, I was really uh, happy with uh, the results. So let's keep that momentum going. I really appreciate it. So I guess we'll start with me, right? Number Here five. Go. All Here right. We go. Uh, for me, this one was kind of, you know, I, I saw I saw it coming and I thought, well, this was one I rewatched. One of the two that I rewatched coming into this one. I got Alfred Hitchcock's Torn Curtain here with uh, Paul Newman and Julie Andrews. It's the uh, political thriller where uh, Paul Newman is, is a scientist who is uh, where Julie Andrews believes he is a spy for, you know, East, Eastern Germany. I mean, he's actually kind of a double agent. He's actually pretending to be a spy for Germany, but actually being an American spy. And it has a, those nice little psychological spy twits, spy twists, you know, about, you know, are people watching you? Are you being followed? That, that type of thing that I really liked. I know there were some like uh, uh, some heated exchanges between Paul Newman and Alfred Hitchcock on the set of this film. I guess Hitchcock didn't like the fact that Newman's salary probably took up almost 20% of the budget for the film. And, uh, he's, and, and, you know, as much as I like Hitchcock, maybe you shouldn't hold that over the actor. That, that That's something that between the agent and the studio uh, that, he, that should have been addressed. But, you know, I, I thought it was a top-notch film. Now, this is the funny part about it. It probably wouldn't make my top 10 Hitchcock movies. But it's still good enough to be in my top five for 1966. So that's what I got at five. It it, it has the best scene of it, how hard it is to kill someone. Yes. In that movie. Yes. <laughs> or how hard it can be. Yes, exactly. Doc, what do you got? Me, uh, I, I think at this era, for my age and everything else, uh, 53. Uh, so these are movies that I... Are attracted to for certain reasons, be it the Western style or the actor or the actresses and uh, and the genre themselves. So I like my Westerns. I like all that kind of stuff. So I, my number five is the original Django, if you want the truth. So that's my number really? five. Wow. Uh, I think it's, uh, 
you can see why Django and Chain. You can see where Quentin gets some of his pulls from here, obviously. And there's a lot of movies in this era that you know, you know, the Camerons of the world and whoever else is around is pulling from this era to bring it to eighties, nineties, two thousands, whatever. But Django is a uh, yeah, it's a cheesy, over the top kind of sense to it. It's got the Western setting, uh, the Mexicans, the KKK, and the, you know. The, the machine guns and the, the power weapons and it's right at a predator in some senses and <laughs> this gun could have been used so it's uh it, it's it's my kind of flick it's uh has a lot going on for it it's really well done and uh you know uh, for my kind of movie this this fits the bill right kind of like in a sweet spot for me uh, especially with that so we say quentin feel original side i like that a lot so django's gonna be one five for me very nice Right. right. My number five is going to be uh, Blowout, which is the first English English language film for director Michelangelo Antonioni. It's set in the swing London era, which Austin Powers movies uh, parody. <laughs> that period. And the protagonist is played by David Hen Hemmings in probably his best role. He's this bored, cynical photographer who's kind of flippant with the models, doesn't treat them that well. But one night while he's shooting pictures in the park, he thinks he may have witnessed a murder. And this happens when he starts blowing up the pictures. And then you can see him loving his craft of photography. In fact, it's more about him and his, his progression and how he feels about things than actually solving the perceived mystery in this movie. And, it's, and, and the last scene is still a scene that people are trying to figure out, kind of like <laughs> 2001. If you, if, you, if you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, yeah. That's what's going to be my number five is Blowout. So Blow Up? Yep. Or Blow Out. Blow Out. Okay. So. No, it's Blow Up. Blow Up. Blow Up. I blow up. Yeah. Oh, Blow Up. <laughs> yeah. Blow Out. Was blow, blow Out was the, the one where with uh, John Travolta. Travolta. That's right. It was <laughs> yeah. made on the same premise where did he hear something? Yeah. That's right. I screwed that up. <laughs> we were going to say, it's a very young John Travolta in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My number five is The Sand Pebbles. This is starring Steve McQueen. Uh, three hours. It's a little long in my eyes, but still a real uh, powerful, effective kind of anti-war movie. In fact, Steve McQueen got his only Oscar nomination for this picture. Uh, he's a sailor assigned to a U.S. gunboat. Uh, stationed in the uh, Yangtze River over in China, establishing a U.S. presence during their uh, turmoil and upheaval politically over there in the 1920s, a lot of unrest, and, uh, you know, things come to fruition eventually, and uh, it's, it's just a solid movie. If you haven't seen it, and if you're a Steve McQueen fan, I'm sure you have, but The Sand Pebbles, a solid 60s, mid-60s classic for me, number five. Nice. Wow. I had to watch that. I've never seen it. Yeah, it's good. It's worth checking out. So th about three hours. It's, so I got to set that. Yeah. All right. Set aside a solid three hours for that one. <laughs> All right. So moving on to number four. This is the reason I had to like verify, Randy, that I wrote it down right. I've got blow up here at number four for me. And uh, I have the kind of the same things. I put disenchanted photographer accidentally stumbles upon a murder. Uh, I, I, to add on to what you had, I like the scene where she comes back to visit him and basically they're just, this is weird flirtation between them and that he gives her the wrong role of film on purpose and she gives him a fake number on purpose. So it's that automatic distrust of, of the, the two together that I thought was really uh, uh, such a cool scene. Uh, I think you're right. I think it's Hemming's. Uh, best role, also Vanessa uh, Redgrave's in it as well. So I really enjoyed the film. Um, so I'm putting it at number four. Doc? Good pick. Yep. Um, my number four is The Professionals. I'm just going to get right into it. That's uh, I, I got Lee Marvin, I got Burt Lancaster, uh, Jack Pollock's playing on the, the Mexican side of things here. And, uh, I like my westerns and stuff like this at the time, man. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's maybe not a western in every sense uh, a western setting yes uh, the kidnapped damsel in distress and, uh, being hired to you know bring back a kidnapped wife uh, i wouldn't want to go too far with the story here but 
No, I got, I got Burt Lancaster. I got Lee Marvin in the movie here uh, in, the, in the mid '60s, and it's got my kind of setting, my kind of setup. Jack Palance is in it as well. He's actually very good in it as well, considering uh, the role that he plays. Great, my sweet spot, man. Uh, you like uh, a lot of twists and turns of this story, if you want the truth. A uh, little backstabbing here and there, and it's uh, a little bit more to it than just a standard straight at you kind of Western, I would say, or something along those lines. So. Uh, the Professionals is, like I said, right up my alley again, man. So, good cast. It's going to come at number four for me, 66. Excellent. Randy. Well, I'm picking uh, for my, what, number four, okay. Uh, La Duhem Souffle. And I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. The English translation is Second Wind, is Jean-Pierre Melville, uh, and he was one of, he's probably my favorite French director. And he was always good at these genre films. And this is like a film noir shot in black and white, even though it's in 1966. Has this great heist sequence. And like any heist, you know, something's either going to go wrong during the heist or afterwards when it's time to split up the money or whatever. And this is no exception. And it's just, it's, it's just a great genre film. And you'll probably see other Melville films in maybe future rankings, but I really like this film. Nice. Right. Nice. Should we make him pronounce it one more time, guys, just for sheer fun? No. Let's not, man. That's pretty torturous, man. <laughs> <laughs> Need to work on my French. <laughs> Rich, what do you got? I've got another French film, King of Hearts. Uh, this is by Philippe de Broca, starring Alan Bates and jean bierre Bougeot. Uh, this is kind of a quirky, eccentric film. Uh, the Germans have planted a bomb in a French village, and a soldier played by Alan Bates is ordered to uh, dismantle the bomb. Uh, except when he gets there, the village is completely deserted except for the insane asylum. All the, the inmates in the insane asylum are left behind. Eventually, they, they get out, and they appoint Alan Bates as like a, a ruler or a king, a messiah, whatever. And they run their own little, you know, village, and everybody's kind of wacky. And it's kind of a light-hearted affair, but it's charming. It's a little cult film that I've always liked. Uh, I've seen it, you know, a couple times when I was younger, and it, it always stuck with me. So King of Hearts, 1966. That'll be my number four. Nice. All right. Nice diversity so far. That's what I really yeah. like about it. Yeah, I really. Yeah, so far for sure. Like Doc, everything's right in your wheelhouse. None <laughs> of that's a surprise right there from Doc. So uh, number three for me, I guess maybe this one falls into a little bit more of the convenient categories. I do have a man for all seasons here. I, I think it's maybe one of Paul Schofield's best roles ever. And I do, and, and Rich knows I like period pieces that are very, you know, very much of the time and historic in nature. Uh, you know, obviously it's a story of Thomas More and how he refused to give Henry VIII an annulment uh, from, from his marriage. And it, that decision ultimately ends up in uh, Thomas More's demise, you know, but, and it, it goes into the politics of, you know, being in, in, in the court of the king and those types of situations and uh is it a little it, it's a little slow in places for sure but i think it's interesting enough if you're in you're into history and things like that that it kind of the, the weight of the story itself kind of carries it through it's also got susanna york in it orson wells and uh fred zinnerman i think he's also in it as well so uh, i picked number three man, a man for all seasons i know that that was nominated for best picture if i'm not mistaken so it was actually won. Won. It, yeah, it did won. it? Yes. Yeah. Did it? Yep. There you go. Doc, Doc, what do you got for three? And you had Robert Shaw on that too, I believe, right? So, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're right. Hey. Uh, my number three is going to sound like probably Randy's number five and your number four because mine it is blow up for number three for me as well. So, uh, yeah, you guys have touched on uh, basically uh, what the story is about. Uh, is it real? Is it real? I guess that's the question at the end of the movie and stuff like that. And uh, I saw the remake first. Uh, I would say Blowout or the take from it uh, when I was a lot younger. But yeah, David Hemmings is really good in this. Uh, Vanessa Redgrave. And, you know, there is some, Yeah, you, you don't even know. You're trying to follow the story. You don't even know what, sometimes at what point you're actually 
what am I really watching here? You know, this is where is this actually going until until you get towards the last, so we say the last act of what's going on in the movie. But uh, it's worth the wait. And I, I like those kind of flicks, man. Uh, blow ups. Once again, the maybe this is uh, see I, I get away from the westerns there for you, Brian. So this is this is the other side of me. This is all this other kind of stuff that I like and. Yeah. You'll probably see that at my number two as well when we get there. <laughs> uh, yeah, blow up is my number three. Okay. You know, uh, three of you know three of us had it so far. I also I thought about Nightcrawler quite a bit when I was rewatching that film because that it, it feels like Nightcrawler kind of pulled a lot of those elements into that into that movie as well. Yeah. Uh, the one with Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, so it just kind of reminded me of that while you were talking about it again. So yeah. Randy, what do you think? All right. So my number three is, for the second year in a row, a Roman Polanski film. And I'm putting it in Cul-de-Sac, which is Ooh. another film shot in black and white. Uh, <laughs> and it's often called a dark comedy, but it's more like these unique characters and these strange situations. And I don't really know how much comedy there is in it, but it's got these two wounded criminals who end up at this kind of remote castle and when the tide is in, it's actually an island that you can't get to. And Lionel Stander, who was in Heart to Heart, which I don't know, he's the butler or driver or something. I didn't really watch that show, but I know yeah. he was in. But uh, he plays this. No, that's right. Huh? That's right. You're right. Heart to Heart. Yes. Yeah. Yep. He's, this, he's this gruff, obnoxious thief. They're holding these two uh, castle owners captive until he can meet up with his boss. Well, he's hoping the boss will send someone for him because their uh, attempted heist or robbery did not turn out and they're both wounded. And uh, Donald Pleasance plays this prissy husband and Francoise Dorliac plays this younger unfaithful wife. And in fact, she's the younger uh, sister of um, Catherine Deneuve. Right. And died, died tragically the next year in an automobile accident, unfortunately. But, uh, but it's just the sight of these people and their interactions are just so unique. It's, it's hard to describe. And I've always kind of loved that film just for those reasons. That's my number three. Nice. Nice. I... Very good. My number three is exactly what Brian's number three, A Man for All Seasons. Again, historical drama, it won six Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Director, Fred Zinneman, and Best Actor, Paul Schofield. It was a, a big, big hit. Well, you know, costumes, the cinematography, those uh, period pieces that Brian mentioned, you know, he covered it. Great cast, Robert Shaw, Orson Welles, Vanessa Redgrave, John Hurt, in one of his early roles, Susanna York. It's loaded with uh, great actors and actresses in it. And it's basically a man holding true to his principles, uh, and paying the ultimate price for his beliefs in the end. So a, a solid, solid movie. And the 60s were known for a lot of these period pieces like The Lion and Winter and Beckett, Cleopatra, right on down the line. And I think uh, A Man for All Seasons is right there with them. So that's my number three. All right. Very nice. All right. So we're moving on to number two. Awesome. This number was two. one. <laughs> this is one. Since... Randy has a thing against like uh, you know only <laughs> watching black and white films. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I I have pers I have Persona here, uh, wow. an Igmar Bergman film uh, with B.B. Anderson and Liv Ullman. I thought this one I you know I I watched it and then I watched it again. I was like, do I really understand it? Is it just being literal? And then I then I read. I have to share this with you guys. I read the uh, just this paragraph here from uh, Roger Ebert who said. Persona is a film that we return to over the years for the beauty of its images and because we hope to understand its mysteries. It is apparently not a difficult film. Everything that happens is perfectly clear, and even the dreams are clear. But it suggests buried truths and despair finding them. Persona was one of the first movies he, uh, Roger Ebert ever reviewed in 1967. And he said, I did not think he understood it at the time. He said, a third of a century later... I know most of what I'm supposed to know about <laughs> films, and I'm not really truly sure I understand it still. 
So I thought that that was really kind of cool and kind of sums up the movie. But yeah. it's, you know, it's basically dealing with schizophrenia. It's a, a personalities that are kind of thrust back together and dealing with uh, two people go in, one person comes out type of scenario. And uh, I thought it was a really psychological, psychologically a very interesting film that I, I, I would definitely go revisit. It, enough of the material is so interesting to me in the way it's shot that I, I think it's a, it's a great film for for the age for sure so i recommend it highly if nobody's seen it so persona good choice yeah nice uh yeah just missed for me if you want the truth brian uh, i like that movie actually man uh my number two is the movie seconds with uh once again, I have like I guess I have all these different angles of this is right up my alleys, but this is one right up my alley again because this is uh, yeah. Look, man, I like the Twilight Zone. I like all that kind of stuff, and this has exactly that kind of vibe to it. If you want the truth, so uh, Rock Hudson portraying somebody who's I guess really John Randolph really is playing <laughs> his role at the beginning, but uh, shall we say like the original Face Off with a Twilight Zone vibe to it and. Uh, mm -hmm life-changing uh story for him as he moves along and what he wants in life and how he wants to change his life and uh the john frankenheimer flick man this is uh i'd say a twisted view the twilight zone vibe black and white movie rock hudson really really good in this movie man and not maybe even the best time of his life at this time for him so uh great performance Great performances and uh yeah this murray hamilton's in a lot of good uh secondary cast uh, actors in this one too so seconds is a great flick man that's that's my number two that was pretty easy for me this year very nice very cool yeah very good all right randy well number two for me is one that doc has mentioned and that is the professionals awesome. great great action adventure Western movie with a twist at the end, uh, written and directed by Richard Brooks. The cinematography on this movie is just awesome. amazing. That's the one thing when I just rewatched it, I go, the lighting's like always perfect. And then I did notice that he was nominated for Academy Award for this movie. It's Conrad Hall, but he, he didn't win, although he's won three times. But, you know, the cinematography in that movie was just amazing. And two of my favorite actors are in this, Lee Marvin and Robert Ryan. She's also mentioned Berlant, yeah. well, which is great. And Woody great. Strum, great as well. Just you just can't, can't find four actors like that in, in nowadays. I don't think. You can. No. And, uh, but uh, and I loved how they we're introduced to them. Each of them. Well, um, Ralph Bellamy is looking for someone to go find his abducted wife, and you you get introduced to each one of them, and you see their character, which, which was really cool. And of course, his wife is played by the alluring Claudia Cardinale, which is oh amazing. my goodness! And and it has probably the best, <laughs> one of the best ending lines ever in movies about being a bastard. I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> Look at this movie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The professionals at number two for Randy. Rich, awesome. what do you got? Uh, when I heard Claudia Cardinale, I, I sort of froze a minute. That's uh, tough to get past. <laughs> Anyway, my number two is, uh, I'm sure your guy's number one, or at least one of your guys, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly by Sergio Leone. Uh, Clint Eastwood, of course, The Man with No Name, a spaghetti western, an epic proportion, the iconic sound, soundtrack, uh, everybody knows. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, you got <laughs> Lee Van Cleef and Eli Wallach. I mean, three, uh, the use of close-ups, you guys mentioned this, last time when we talked in 1965 about for a few dollars more it's the same you know the similar style just concluding the the trilogy it's fantastic uh, i think this is clearly the best of the three movies in my opinion uh you know a fistful of dollars a few dollars more and the good the bad and the ugly i had to have it on here uh, only topped by my number one choice which will be revealed shortly but uh i'll let you guys talk about it if you care to nice <laughs> Maybe talking. <laughs> Keep talking. It's going to be three, three in a row here. <laughs> it, 
this yeah this movie is just iconic what's I, I, you should the irony of this movie is and it is going to be my number one my number one is going to be the good the bad and the ugly the the irony of this is if you go to search for the good the bad and the ugly the soundtrack gets more hits than the actual movie <laughs> does <laughs> so so that just gives you an indication that the song ecstasy of gold is like highly streamed on spotify i mean that's it, you know just lends you to that any Ennio morricone uh you know sound that has so yeah it's my number it's my number one the three gun singers that kind of dance around you know trying to get this gold and they go shift they go from shifting alliances constantly throughout the film and <laughs> <laughs> to stabbing each other in the back any chance that they get i think it's really really cool definitely the epitome of spaghetti westerns uh, I think uh, the length obviously always comes into question, and but the type of shooting and cinematography is just fantastic. It was, uh, I it was again just like last year. I wrote this movie down f right off the bat as my number yeah. one, so that's my number one. Yeah, there's a shocker, eh? So yeah, <laughs> I guess I'll uh, ride on those coattails now, buddy, because it's it's my number one too. So. Uh, <laughs> Good, the bad, the ugly, the ugly, the bad, the good, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> you go the end scene, right? <laughs> but it's a, uh, yeah, it's like it, this is a classic. Uh, I, I think uh, maybe taking away from like even modern movies and stuff like that. Sometimes the story's really good and they tell it too fast, or sometimes the the story's really crappy and they spread out a long time to tell you a crappy story. I think a lot of movies in the last twenty years suffer from this in a certain degree here here it's it's a three hour uh but it's not a three hour slow burn this is a three hour uh epic western flick and uh i consider it like a, a top tier western <laughs> in my and i love my yeah. western so this is right at the top i've, I've got a few that i'd throw into the mix and clip's going to be in a couple of them but uh yeah, this is this is the uh, the epitome of a western in my eyes, man. Like you said, you've touched on it—the backstabbing, the, the twist, the turns, <laughs> the characters. You've been clipping yeah. to Tuco, you know, Eli Wallach, man. These, these performances of Tuco's a quite the disturbed little character himself, man. Because that guy is <laughs> maybe steals the show almost in some senses. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just a fantastic western flick, man. That's my number one too. Traditionally, guys named Tuco, not good guys, right? Not Breaking, good guys. Bad. Breaking Bad, good to bad, the ugly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't work out. <laughs> Randy, what do you got for your yeah. number one? Yeah, back to back number ones for Sergio for me is good. The good, the mad, the ugly as well, filled with great scenes. Uh, but I was watching, and I don't always do this, but once in a while, if they're reviewing a movie, you have those uh, channels where they watch the movie, you know, uh, uh, what do you call those reaction channels or reacting to a movie? Yeah, right. They were reacting to uh, North by Northwest, oh. uh, which is one of my favorites. Totally. And yeah. She was talking about the scene where they're, where he's out in the corn, you know, about by the cornfield out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And she's going, well, one of my problems with this is that, you know, you see the car go by and then you see the bus and it just takes so long. And and I'm, like, I'm, I'm thinking, she would never make it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Why do I got to look at this guy's face for so long? <laughs> but, but one thing, what, and this is Ennio in, in Morricone's best score, I think, and my favorite yeah. score, maybe of anybody. And then the Ecstasy of Gold, when they're playing the, that piece, when mm -hmm. uh, Eli Wallach's running through the graveyard is just amazing. And Fantastic. In fact, you talked about streaming that song. They're using that in a ton of commercials, which I hate. I think. Yeah, there's yeah. a there's a remix. There's a remix yeah. version of it that's on a lot of sports channels. You'll hear it all the time. Yeah, but yeah. But just a fantastic movie with great scenes and just perfection for me. Perfect. Very good, Rich. My you're you're the one. guy breaking from the norm here. Let's hear it. Well, my number one is one that you guys had earlier, and that's Blow Up. That's my favorite movie of 66. Wow. There you go. Just my style of movie where you have to think and you put yourself in a position of, in this case, David Hemmings, uh, you know, shooting the, he's flirting around with the girls and then, you know, by chance he's taking pictures. And what does he see when he's developing his 
photographs, but uh, my murder and piecing it together uh, with the you know blowing up these huge images and what does it really lead to? I, I like that '60s lifestyle that Randy talked about too. There's a little menage a trois going on with the two girls and. You know, the 60s, I would love to have been like 10 years older in the 60s and experienced that myself, if you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, and, and it's a very influential film because directors like Brian De Palma in Blow Up, or Blow yeah. Out, excuse me. Yeah. Blow Out. Um, I screwed I screwed that up for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And Francis Coppola for The Conversation. There's a lot of similarities. There you go. Yeah. In, in both of those films to what goes on here. This came first, so... You got to give it its props. Very artsy kind of film by Antonioni. It's style over substance, maybe a little bit, but uh, if you go with it and 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 ride it out, it's it's really a rewardable, uh, rewarding movie. And Randy talked about the last shot with the mime tennis players, which is interesting too. What is that? <laughs> I mean, it you know he threw that in, I guess, just to f with us a little bit. But anyway, a, a great movie. Uh, in fact, I'd like to see it again soon because it's piquing my interest as we talk. So. Very nice. Very we had a lot of yeah, we had a lot of similarities. I mean, for movies, I didn't think that we were going to have necessarily uh, all of us. I mean, I, I like the fact that a couple of people had the professionals on there. Yeah, yeah. Rich and I had Man for All Seasons. Yeah, you know, Blow Up. You know, obviously on everybody's list and Good to Bad on everybody's list. You know. We're starting to head yeah. in a direction there where the cream rises to the top sometimes, and that's yeah, great. Just, so. just to go over the Oscars that year, A Man for All Seasons did win Best Picture, but check out these four nominees. Uh, three of them we didn't even have mentioned. Alfie with Michael Caine. The Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. Nobody had that. That was a big picture. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which was... Yeah, it was there. For it's acting, but I, it just doesn't work for me. The, the, the subject matter and that type of thing. And the Sand Pebbles was actually a nominee, which I did have. Uh, but overall, you know, a, a typical 60s year. And uh, I like The Fortune Cookie, which is an interesting little comedy with Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau. I like that movie a lot, but it didn't make my list. Yeah, yeah I, thought, I thought Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf looked more like a film play where a man for yes. all season, even though it was a play. Yeah. It yeah. Really, you know, worked better, I thought. But, Very staging. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, you can but see. I, I had some extras too. I wanted to. Yeah, mention. what do you got? Harper with Paul Newman, I thought was yeah. really pretty good. Uh, I had seconds as well, and a man for all yeah. seasons. El Dorado, which was the second. Uh, this it was just basically Rio Bravo with a couple different actors in it. Uh, the Quiller Memorandum with George Siegel, I thought was a pretty good yeah. uh, spy thriller. Uh, Fantastic Voyage because of the. Yeah, special effects and stuff for the time I thought was really interesting. Plus, it's got Raquel Welch. That's right. And, <laughs> and right. then the best of the uh, parodies, Our Man Flint. There was like a ton of parodies of the James Bond movies. There was like two Matt Helms. There was one where the spies are with David Niven. There's all these uh, movies that Bond kind of, you know, in the image of Bond. And uh, Bond. Yeah. Our Man Flint, I thought, was the best of the parodies. <laughs> Well, that does it for 1966, everybody. I, we really appreciate you guys watching. What I'd like to do is make sure that you guys uh, leave your uh, top five down below as well. I'm always interested in seeing what different movies crop up on other people's lists. We appreciate you liking and subbing and commenting. Uh, we're going to be doing this, like I said, all the way through 1979. So try to stay tuned to the channel. We appreciate everybody who watches and comes back and all that good stuff. Big thank you to Randy, Rich, Doc, for doing this with me. I really appreciate it, guys. And uh, we'll catch you guys next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Ciao.